Welcome everyone, this is Heavy Metal and Booze. We are here with the, the great, legendary Brian Dattler of Diamond Head. Yeah! Thank you. Welcome, uh, we would like to welcome to the show. Thank you. And it's a quite an, it's, it's an extreme honor to finally meet you. Thank you. Uh, what we'd like to start off is, uh, you guys have been around for over 40 years now. Started in what, 1976? Yep, yeah. 1976 I started the band. Uh, while I was still at school with the, uh, the original drummer Duncan and uh, built it from there, you know, yeah, it's an old time. It did, you know, we stopped a couple of times, but it has been going on and off since 76, so it's a hell of a long time. Yeah, I did some research and I've noticed that, the, as you mentioned, there has been some stoppages and uh, and uh, one of the things that I did read that, that helped you guys was, uh, was Metallica and, and Megadeth. Uh, playing some of your material and of course your backdated items were you know started yeah. getting a lot of sales yeah yeah it's been a huge help to uh especially the, the metallica releases um the the, uh, the four songs that they've covered with diamond Head has, has helped send those songs out into the world really and keep help keep diamond Head alive and and bring in new fans because you get lots and lots of uh people say i got into metallica through i got into diamond head through metallica uh and and that's fine with me. I mean, as long as you get there eventually, exactly, it's, it's fine. So if you've got, you, you know, for example, Am I Evil? Some people think Am I Evil is a Metallica song, mm -hmm. and then you look in the small print says originally recorded by Diamond Head. So people may think, oh, I'll check that out then. I'll see see what Diamond Head sound like, and that's how we've made a lot of fans. Because we never toured the US back in the day, which mm -hmm. would have been nice in the eighties. So uh, we're trying to make up for it now. Okay. Yeah, and I, I was reading too, I mean, like you said, the, uh, the multiple breaks, uh, uh, you were pretty big in uh, the early to mid 80s and then the early to mid 90s mm. and then 2000s and onward. Yes. Uh, but there's been there's been a lot of uh, uh, lineup changes too. Yeah, not as many as White Snake, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, we've probably had about 13, 14 different members over the years. Yeah, we've had, you know, yeah, it's hard to keep a band together, isn't it? Yeah, well, how, like, when, how does it affect your creativity when you've um, had the, the different lineup changes? I mean, you're pretty much the heart and soul. You've been here since day one. Yeah. Normally, um, a new person coming in brings new ideas, and that can be quite good. Uh, obviously, they learn the old material, and that's the main thing that keeps you going. But uh, when it comes to, a, as I say, a new, especially like a new senior like we've got now, Rasmus, who's been in about four years. So Rasmus has got a lot of fresh ideas, a lot of fresh in, input and energy. And I think that's uh, really creative. I, I, I kind of, uh, you know, work with that. I, I think it's a good, uh, it's been a good thing, you know, Raz, Raz joining for the uh, last album and this new album that we're working on. Yeah, and we were outside waiting and uh, patiently, of course. <laughs> and uh, we heard you guys uh, doing uh, the sound yeah. rehearsal and he he can hit the high notes. Oh yeah, he's he's hitting he's uh he's uh, picking up some of that Sean Harris. Yeah, he, he, <laughs> I mean a lot of the set is is the older stuff yeah. that, that was you know Sean had co-written, and uh, he he's easy able to do all that, but he has got an extremely high range. So yeah, for his own stuff, things from the last album and, and stuff, uh, they're very. You know, powerful. He has got a powerful voice and a powerful, you know, a high range. So he can he can just swoop, swoop and soar really amongst the uh, the guitars and the riffs and and uh, it does add a lot of uh, energy to the uh, the songs. Okay, it's, it's great. It's a real find, I think. You know, he's never he'd never done an album before. I'd never heard of him. You know, he wasn't in like a, a famous band or anything. Uh, just uh, through a friend of a friend. Uh, we got in touch and uh, yeah, it's great, superb. Do you still keep in touch with uh, past members as well? I do. I, I see the bass player and drummer, Colin and Duncan, more than I see Sean. Uh, I, I still visit uh, old drummer Duncan, who's been a friend since we were about like 11 or something. Uh, I go around his house very often on maybe a Sunday and uh, have a cup of tea and chat about the old days and stuff. Uh, I don't see the, the guys who joined, you know, because we originally we all lived in the same little village. Okay. So we all still live quite close, so it's easy to see those guys, Colin and Duncan and that. Uh, but people like, you know, for example, 
I mean, we lost a drummer, Robbie France, who moved to Spain, uh, who died a few years ago. Uh, but uh, I've spoke to Merv, the, one of the bass players, uh, about a month ago. Um, I don't see Dave Williamson very often. Uh, Nick moved to Australia, the last singer. Uh, so I might get the odd phone call or email, but uh, I haven't seen Nick for a while. And uh, let me think. The last bass player still lives around by me, so I bump into him occasionally. Yeah, good. Okay. So it's sort of, you know, everybody's still friends and there's no falling out. Okay. Yeah, I was reading also uh, back in the day when you first formed, of course, uh, you had played, uh, uh, one of your first shows was a high school show. And yeah. it was about a 40 minute gig of your own recorded songs, your own personally recorded songs. We hadn't recorded anything. Or uh, you written them yet? Yeah, we'd written them all ourselves. And we'd probably put them onto a cassette. But now we hadn't been in the studio or made a demo or anything at that point. That was 1977. That was with a, a previous bass player to Colin as well, called Jim. Uh, but yeah, it was at our old school. Uh, just played in the school hall and charged probably like 25p for tickets. And uh, it was great. It was a big, ex you know, exciting time. Your first gig is really <laughs> exciting. And we did all our own material, which in hindsight is very brave. For those who are tuning in, 25p is roughly about about 36 yeah. American cents, yeah, I think. Probably. About about that much. It's not yeah. much. Yes, it's not. <laughs> that, it, hey, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you probably you even uh, did a cover of uh, back a long time ago of uh, Motorhead's self-titled song. We did. Motorhead. I think that he did it once or twice. We didn't do, the, do it at that first gig, but one of the early gigs, maybe the, the first five or six gigs, we did uh, Motorhead. And we we did um, Paranoid once or twice. Yeah, it was Sabbath, yeah. And uh, we even did um, Space Station Number Five as well once or twice. Okay. But, but we kind of felt we weren't very good at, at doing covers, so and we we were really interested in writing our own songs, and we spent all our focus went on writing rather than learning other people's songs. Well, you've been, you've been did some uh, collaborations with the great Tony Iommi and, and Dave Mustaine. That was in 1992. Uh, yes, yes, we, we got to co-write a song with uh, Tony Iommi, who lives local, okay. not far, only about 10 miles away. And then uh, Dave Mustaine got in touch and we had a meeting and uh, sent him the tapes while he was over here in California. And uh, he played guitar on, on the track truck in and, and remixed it. and. Uh, on the album and uh, yeah we were both really good okay uh, now you also have a uh, to, to bring everybody up to speed to the present day you do have uh, an album coming out yes. sometime soon yes we've finished it uh, except for some of the mixing we're just finishing up the mixing okay um, we want to get it out as soon as possible but we'd still it, it, some of the negotiations with label and stuff like that so we're not quite there yet we're not quite ready to announce the title and the cover and release and, okay. and things like that. Okay. But yeah, it's coming. But uh, there was a, wait, maybe a song title or two? Yeah, we've got a song on it called A Sleeper. A Sleeper? And there's another song called The Belly of the Beast. Oh, that sounds like a good one. Yeah. It sounds yeah, like Anthrax. Yeah. That'll probably be track one <laughs> side one. That's quite a, okay. quite a fast one. Okay. So are they good? Uh, do you have anything? Uh, ask them about the big one. Okay, now when you, uh, in 2011, uh, I was in R R RF Milton Hall, uh, as we had you know, talked earlier today. Mm -hmm. um, I, was, I was in the United States Air Force, and I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Of course, Sonosphere 2011, the uh, Nebworth, United Kingdom, which is a hollow ground for bands like Queen and Led Zeppelin yeah. and Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd, and you got to special guest the entire venue. And then, of course, play before you know Slayer, Megadeth, and Anthrax, and mm -hmm. Ultimate Metallica went on stage. That's right. Yeah, we were offered that date. Uh, um, the big floor lineup was probably announced, and then they decided it would be a good idea to get Diamond in on as well as the uh, the opening band, if you like. So we probably went on about say two o'clock in the afternoon or something. And uh, a real fantastic experience for and uh, We did the one in France as well. It was, you oh, know, yeah. it's just kind of uh, traveling. Festival is in the Sonosphere. There, there may be in a dozen dates or so, uh, and we, we did England and France in uh, consecutive days, and that was, a, you know, fantastic to do that. Yeah, for those who don't know, Sonosphere is like the the gigant tour or the rock star mayhem fest of, of Europe. Mm -hmm. It's you know big up there with download festivals. Yeah, well, it's very, very big, popular. Very big. 
Okay. Um, anything else? To... When our grandparents said this Elvis rock and roll music is going to lead to the devil. Who thought? Who knew? They were right. They were. If, if you want to believe that. Well, <laughs> my question is, did you get any flack from your parents when they, no. when, when they saw this, my mother is a witch, yeah. my mother is a bitch, she was burned alive? Yeah. Um, did they say, hey, whoa, 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 are like you okay? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I like the music, so I didn't actually write that lyric, and so therefore it would have been Sean's mother who may have... Uh, did, but did he come back and say, hey, I got you know a little <laughs> no, green... No, I don't think so. No? I think... Because that's pretty strong. It is, for back, the time. Yeah. yeah. Very strong. Uh, I think he's, he thought it was such a big, powerful riff, he needed to do something... To match it. Yes, to match it, that, that suited yeah. the tone, a dark riff, you know, it's a dark, mean, you know, flattened third. Flattened uh, fifth kind of riff, isn't it? So uh, he came up with a great lyric, and and it just married perfectly with that that uh, riff, doesn't it? Yeah, fair play. And ultimately, it's a huge hit, anyways. It's yeah, it it's, it's, it's still hit. our biggest song. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I did read. Uh, of course, you guys are part of the uh, the British wave of new of heavy metal, um, which is of course very important time in, in, in heavy metal in yeah. history. Yeah. You know. It brought in bands like, uh, of course, we mentioned already Metallica, Slayer, Anthrax, Megadeth, part of the uh, thrash metal history. But then uh, in the 90s, uh, I read this on, on Wikipedia. Anybody could post anything on there, and people would believe it. But I did read something on there about how Sean Harris in the 90s showed up dressed as the Grim Reaper. And there's a statement yeah. where he said that that was pretty much him signifying the end of the new wave of British heavy metal. Mm, I don't know if he meant that. I think he meant the end of Diamond Head. That's what he was trying to say because he didn't want to continue. With okay. Uh, so he yeah, just uh, that was for that getting Metallica gig in ninety three. Yeah. If they're not looking for, and he didn't. He hadn't told us he was going to do that. Uh, but he, I think it was always just going to be a bit of a project, an album project for sure. And uh, so he didn't want to continue. And he thought he was being clever, kind of making a statement. Couldn't really sing properly through that mask. You know, oh yeah, <laughs> for a it's not many seem to be able to do that anyways. No. <laughs> now uh, going through the years over time, and uh, like I said earlier, with uh, the different lineup changes, what has there ever been uh, gripes or or complaints or times where it was too many ideas clashing, or too many times where you just like, well, that's not going to make it in this album. I don't like this, or let's try it a little bit better than this. Well, you just if you can't use your idea or your song, you just put it on the back burner, and we try it another time. Uh, you could only, you know, you can only get so many songs on the album. We had more songs than we needed for mm -hmm. that first Light to the Nations album and Borrowed Time, things like that. So if you couldn't get them on, we'd have a little, you know, mini discussion, mm -hmm. argument type thing, and say, well, this song, this song, this song. And we can't put that on, so we we'll leave that. Or this can go on a B side, or that can go on an EP, or something like that. And we just kind of work it out. I always realise you need more songs uh, than you think you need, you know, mm -hmm. because you're going to get asked for extra tracks and EPs, and you know, the, the material soon starts getting eaten up. Uh, so we did that, and um, yeah, yeah, I mean, you have little discussions, but now we never fell out about it. You know, it was always for the good of the band, for the cause. Yeah. And as I say, if, if this song didn't make it onto the record, then you'd probably revisit it in a couple of years and say, well, we've still got this one, you know. For example, Wild on the Streets was written in 1978, and it didn't make it onto vinyl till 1993. <laughs> so we kept that Better one. Than never. <laughs> it just never found its way onto vinyl until the Death and Progress album, and we thought, well, we'll have another go at that. And it sounded great, so... We've was it, it was it re-recorded then at that point? Oh yeah, re-recorded. Okay. It would only ever make like a cassette, yeah, in you know demo, and then uh, you'd play it live and things, but you wouldn't actually put it on record until you decided to record it. You know, we wouldn't record more songs than we need. We'd just decide what we were going to record. Okay. Now to bring it back a little bit, we're going to go back to the the, the beginning of Diamond Head. Uh, not many people know this, or probably don't know who he is. Uh, maybe you can help us a little bit. Uh, you got the band Diamond Head from a Phil Manzanar album? Yeah. Of the same title? Yeah, that's right. 
Phil Manzanero was in Roxy Music, okay. which is a big band in England, and he had a solo album, and I had the poster with Rick Train on it, and I just cut the name out and thought, that's a good name for the band, and I stuck the name on my bedroom wall and thought, that's a good name for the band, you know, because we were looking for names, we had some yeah. rubbish names, and people would suggest things, and, and then once I figured out Diamond Head, I thought, what can you say negative? about a diamond you know right so i thought it was a good name and we adapted that name and, and slowly but surely people got to know it and like them do you remember any of the names that didn't make it um i think we had scepter and cobra and things like that you know possibly even wolf you know another it was a bank called wolf but after we ditched it you know we had a few uh but we only ever gigged as Diamond Head. We never did a gig under a different name. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So then, uh, I'm trying to think of, I had I had a question in my head. It just ran away. Um, <laughs> were you okay, I got it. Right, go ahead. Were you able to watch or did you follow the royal wedding at all? Deal uh, or no deal? Deal or no deal? What's the... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I watched a little bit. It was on while I was... You know, pottering about, but uh, I didn't particularly want to watch it. Now. Yeah, I'm not that interested in the royal family. There's a lot of that here in the states too. Some people will have a full blown tea party with yeah. hats, and oh, then the other people they don't even. There were street parties and everything. Oh wow! Around by where I live, but I think uh, I think we've been gigging or something, and so uh, I've got other things on my mind. So. Um, but I want, I, I'm not the sort of guy who's going to sit there all day and watch a yeah. royal wedding. <laughs> it wasn't even that, that important for even the locals of England, I guess. What's that? So I guess it wasn't even that important for the locals of England either. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people loved the royal family yeah. and, and watched it. And it was very popular. But uh, not everybody. So some, from what I understand, some, some are just like, well, you know, you got these two princes and they're marrying people who are not of royalty blood and just, you know, and they're just like, I know some people have been a little, a little iffy about it. It was like, well, this isn't right, but it's it's their decision ultimately, yeah. anyways. It's better that it's their decision and some arranged marriage. I think you could probably used to that. Yeah. Now, uh, going back in the day and just uh, just touring England in general and, and and Europe, like how much, how different is it doing tours in your home and in England and the surrounding countries as well in Europe? How, how much different is it there than doing, a, let's say, a tour in like North America? Uh, North America is always a lot more driving, a lot more distance between the gigs, which you have to get used to at first. Uh, we very often do a 10 hour drive. Um, and in England, that doesn't happen. You, you, you know, the places are much closer together. It's, yeah. just, it's a much, much, much smaller country, as you know. So. That's the first thing we notice. I mean, the crowds and the PAs and the lights and the venues, they're in a massive difference. Uh, and, you know, sometimes if you play a country or even a place you haven't played before, or, and that, sometimes you get places where they say, oh, I've been looking forward to seeing Diamond for 30 years or something. Mm -hmm. But we, we played Canada last year, we did about 15 dates in Canada. So we hit a lot of places that we'd never played before. And uh, they were really grateful to see that and got really excited about it. Yeah. Whereas, of course, if you play near to where we live, we've done it 20, 30 times. You know, so it's not quite so. You're like, oh, such you're back event. again, huh? <laughs> it's not quite such an event. Yeah. 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 So I did find that, you know, especially if we can go to countries that we've never played. We try and, you know, uh, take on new territories. If, if we can, be, you know, financially. We've still never been to Australia, but uh, maybe one day. Okay, are there any uh, are there any current musicians that influence you a little bit? Uh, I like Joe Bonamassa as a player. Okay, I think his technique is is fantastic. What band is that? It's just a lead guitarist. He was in uh, Black Country Communion. Or oh, he was in Black Country Communion from time to time. But he's a solo lead guitar player. Have you not heard of Joe Bonamassa? Um, no. He's American. I've heard of, <laughs> I, I know. I know. I know of him. I just have. Yeah, so it's like say I've ever listened to. I got one that I'm dying to know. I like him. I like Derek Trucks as well. Okay. Yeah. What do you want to say? Um, obviously, um, your influence on Metallica has been well documented. Everything from lyrics to rhythms and even the solos. 
What do you think about these kids today that don't play solos in their in their music? Is it a cop out, a shortcut, or is it Guitar Hero's fault? I don't know. Uh, what I'm not sure what you mean by kids that don't play solos. There, there's some bands that you you have an instrument in your hand that's that's capable of doing so much more. Yeah. Like if you go up there, you play the blistering solos and, and the Prince and of course you know. It's part Abel of the music, isn't it? The music I grew up with, things like Zeppelin and, and Deep Purple and that. There's a lot of guitar solos, so it, it just felt completely natural to do the same sort of thing where you have your riffs and your, your, so, your guitar solos and things. And, you know, I'm happy to do solos. I don't think it's the be-all and end-all. I think the vocals are the main thing. Mm -hmm. And I think the song is, is probably second. So you have to have a good song, you have to have a good singer. And then, yeah, good solo, great. But it's very often an arrangement tool, isn't it, after the second chorus you might do a guitar solo or you might do a bit late uh, and I, I don't let have done songs that don't contain solos but a lot of the songs do and uh, I'm completely fine with it and some of my favorite songs have incredible guitar solos in them and it just it does feel part of the uh, the uh, arrangement the, the, the mood you know a song I comfortably know you know is half brilliant song half Amazing guitar song. Yeah, yeah. What my friend was, uh, I think, was trying to say was, uh, there's bands, of course, that do the solos, and then there's bands who just chug along with some yeah. some riffs every now and then. And up up to them, them. The... It's up to them. We're yeah. all different. It's. I, I mean, I ain't going to criticize what they do. It's up to them. Okay. Each to their own. That makes sense. You know, as it, it is theirs. Yeah. Yeah, it's their call, isn't it? Okay. Um, you I... have to do something original, idea. Yeah. You know, so if. If you're not a brilliant lead guitarist and you don't, don't feel comfortable doing solos, I'm not going to do it. Okay. Have, have you ever thought about, before you played guitar, was there ever an idea that you was, you picked up, a, you, had, you borrowed the guitar, of course, when you were from, from Diamond Head. Was there ever an yeah. idea of, play. was there ever an idea of, uh, did it ever cross your mind, maybe I should play something different, or was it always guitar? Uh, no, I have drums, I thought drums would be good, and keyboards, I wanted to, you remember Keith Emerson? keyboard player? Nope. Oh, no. Okay. Well, Keith Emerson was a big star keyboard player in Emerson Lake and Palmer. And uh, I, I kind of wanted to be able to do that as well. But uh, I couldn't afford the equipment because it's mm. so expensive keyboards and synthesizers and all that. So because my brother played guitar and had a guitar in the house, I could have a go on his guitar. So I gravitated towards that and eventually forgot the idea of playing drums or keyboards or anything and just focused completely on guitar. Okay. So I probably knew I wanted to do something in music, but it, it ended up being guitar. And of course, everybody would like to be the lead singer, but you yeah. can't sing. You have to play the guitar, don't you? Or play an instrument. Would you sing? I would if I, if I was good. Uh, I, always, okay. I sing backup, okay, but I, yeah. I'm not good enough to be lead vocalist. No, really. Well, you have the, the ability of, the, of shredding on the guitar, so you, yeah. you got that part. Well, I, 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 I focused on that. Yeah. yeah. Singer focuses on singing and lyrics yeah. and being in tune. And it's all teamwork. It's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're all good at what we do. Okay. Uh, one of the things I do like to touch point on, um, it's, 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 it's something, it's uh, more of a personal uh, thing I like to ask. Uh, is there any way you could, or anything you could say to uh, influence somebody out there um, who wants to go out there and, and do something like this, you know, be a part of a band, or, or if, if they don't want to do that, but just do something in their life that's different or could change their life. Is there any way you can, anything you can say to like motivate them to try to do something that's out of, out of the box? I don't know. Uh, I, I mean, for me, it was music. Uh, music fascinated me. I didn't really want to do anything else. I wasn't interested in should, what should we say, you know. There seemed to be, in my um, area. It seemed to be kids were either into motorbikes, fishing, or music. So I was into, you know, I was one of the good guys that learned to play an instrument, form a band, etc., etc. But I, I think if you're in a band, if you like music, you should. The main thing you should do really is learn to write songs, because mm -hmm. I think the songs is what will ultimately keep a band going, moving forward, and, and probably will make money. You know, I think playing guitar is all well and good, but there's millions of guitarists. Uh, 
Whereas you always get one of the good songs, and it's what it's what uh, has kept Diamond Head going. Not the the technique of playing; it's the uh, songs. Okay. We're still playing songs that we wrote thirty five years ago. Okay. And now uh, there's uh, there's other uh, bands out there too. They're they're jumping on this idea of uh, having their own beer. Like Iron mm. Maiden's got the Trooper mm -hmm. Ale and Anthrax. Uh, Megadeth, which is, have got two Megadeth has the one. Yeah. Uh, you guys ever thought about maybe jumping on that too? Yeah, possibly. Uh, not right now, but at the moment, you know, at the moment we're still trying to uh, move forward in in the business area and uh, get the new record out. But uh, maybe one day it'll come on the horizon, and uh, I'm not against it. Okay. Now, I do uh, there are are there some beverages that you that you drink at home? Yeah. Uh, that you they really enjoy, like it's like like Carlsberg or like yeah. what, what's your what's your drink of choice? Uh, the I mean not English. A bit like tea, don't they? Really, yeah. I mean, that's probably the main thing we drink every day. We drink cups of tea over here, it's coffee more, isn't it? Yeah, you know, <laughs> sometimes you ask for tea and they go, Oh, I've got no tea, but no tea <laughs> or they might produce weird tea like orange pico tea or Earl Grey or something. I don't really like, uh, uh, yeah, but alcoholic, <laughs> I, I, you know, alcohol rather. Uh, I'm not a big drinker, so no. I, I don't mind a lager, uh, Carl, Carly, and Carlsberg, yeah. Something light and, and, and refreshing, rather than I'm not a heavy drinker. But, you know, is there anything in the U.S. that you wanted to try, or, or we well, tried a few there? drinks, you know, here and there, but I'm mainly looking for a lager, as to say, uh, or a beer, or something. Something light, like like a, like a Corona or like a Miller Lite. Yeah, or something like that's not too bad. Yeah. Okay. We had Blue Moon and things like that. Blue Moon, that's pretty good. Yeah. Bit. That's a good one but too. Sound, With the orange too, right? I'm not much of a drinker. Okay. Which is a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. Nah. I need to be focused and I need to be, you know, straight. Yeah. Well, uh, that's all the time we have today for okay. Heavy Metal and Booze. <laughs> uh, Brian, it was an honor to meet you. Thank you. Thank you for so you much too. for being on this show with us. And uh, we, look to, we look forward to an awesome show tonight. Yep. Great. All right. Thank you. All right.